hundreds of thousands of people have had cholera. Um, their deaths up the out, uh, you know. They have so many deaths from things like cholera in Haiti, we don't even talk about it because, you know, they're so ordinary. Everybody's dying in Haiti. It's not, not news anymore. So that's part of globalization. Somebody gets sick somewhere, they get on a plane, and everybody gets sick all over. Every flu epidemic we have begins in China, almost with regularity. So that's why, you know, manufacturers of flu vaccine monitor what's going on in China. Why do they monitor what's going on in China? Because whatever's going on in China will be imported here shortly. And so the idea is figure out what's the latest flu, make the vaccine, and by the time it gets here, you hope you're ready. And the reason it all begins in China is that in rural China, people live with the birds, the ducks, and the pigs on the farm. And they spread the uh, the flu to the humans who who live with them. The humans live very close, spread it to other humans, and the epidemic begins each year. We get our yearly our yearly dose of the flu from China. What has been the biggest series of ahas or discoveries since the publishing of the Second Brain that have come to you in the last thirteen years? Some have been good, some have been not so good. So one bad thing has been that progress toward control of very troubling disorders like irritable bowel syndrome looked a hell of a lot better in 1998 than they do now. Why? Well, because the drugs that seem to be very effective for the treatment of IBS or irritable bowel syndrome have now been removed from the market uh, or heavily restricted uh, for reasons of safety. Um, And it's quite controversial, but nevertheless, they are removed. And so right at the moment, there's not a very good way to treat it, that condition. So you treat it with uh, what is called conventional therapy. And what all conventional therapies have in common is failure. So it's not very good for people, that condition. What's the good news? So that's the bad news. (laughs) And the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has taken the tack that um, the irritable bowel syndrome you know, won't kill you. Nobody ever died of irritable bowel syndrome. That's true. But studies have shown that the uh, that condition is very, very detrimental to quality of life and has the same negative impact on quality of life that diabetes does. So I would say, from my way of thinking, that quality of life is not unimportant. I treasure it. And... Uh, the other thing is, I, I think the FDA, and this is just between us, but if you want, you can quote me, is, you know, I think that people don't take diseases of women seriously enough because the people who make decisions are predominantly men, and irritable bowel syndrome is um, female predominant. Explain what it is and tell us why it's female predominant. I'll explain what it is, but I won't tell you why it's female predominant. Okay. And the reason I won't tell you is I I don't know. Okay. That's the short answer. That's honest. I'll tell you something about female predominance in in that in, in a moment. But what it is is a change in bowel habit associated with discomfort and or pain, which is long lasting in the gut. And it can be disabling, can be very, very bad. It is not life-threatening usually, except it can drive people to despair. If you're chained to a toilet seat, you're not very good company. So it's not a good condition to have. And it's best to be able to get rid of it and go through life without this trouble from the gut. I I can't tell you the number of pleas I have for aggravated people who can't stand it anymore. Nevertheless, uh, we don't have very good ways of treating it right now. People are working on it. 
the one thing I can tell you about it's being predominantly in women is that in our society it is, and I have a suspicion, at least in part, it's because um, women are more likely than men to own up to it. Men are too macho. Uh, you know, they don't like to admit that their gut is driving them crazy, whereas women are more likely to seek help. And in Southeast Asia, IBS is a, is a male-predominant disease. Wow, I didn't know that. Asia, the culture is, I think, that men are, are allowed to complain, and women, they don't tolerate complaints from in, in that part of the world. Women, are, you know, you go get back in the field behind your oxen or whatever, take care of the kids. I know it's getting better in some places, you know. Just decide. I think they're even going to let women vote in Saudi Arabia. I was seeing that the other day. I was thinking, <laughs> my God, the so far as to let him drive a car, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or complain of the irritable bowel syndrome. And what's the point of complaining? Because if you went to a male doctor, they can't can't even touch a woman anyway. <laughs> That's true. And they don't let women into medical school, so you know it's tough. Anyway, in our society, it, it, it is female predominant. More so in uh, tertiary practice, of the worst conditions. In any case, uh, I think it's not taken seriously enough. And so, uh, drug therapy that, like NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, Advil, Motrin, uh, you know, they're over the counter. Everybody takes them for um, arthritis. Very strong medicines are available for migraine, but you know the, the, those strike the FDA as real conditions. Whereas IBS, no, I don't understand that. So the, you know, drugs that had much less toxicity than Advil uh, are off the market. I have nothing really complimentary to say about the FDA at this time, so I'm just going to let that go. All right, let's let it go. <laughs> I'm glad the FDA is there. Let's put it this way. You know, it's good to have somebody looking at the drugs. I don't think if, if somebody weren't doing it, we'd be in worse trouble. I think there's more than what they do than what you're talking about. But that's a whole other show and a whole other emphasis. Okay, let's leave that, but, uh, that go. No, that's okay. But I wanted to ask you about the pancreas. Can you share with us what the pancreas does and also about the gallbladder and the tight regulation of pH in the gut. Okay, that's a number of questions. Yes. Okay, let's start with the pancreas. So the pancreas is the major organ for producing the hard-working digestive enzymes. Pancreatic juice can turn a steak into a soup very quickly. Uh, these enzymes break large molecules like the starches that you eat, proteins, um, nucleic acids like DNA, into their component parts. And these components can be absorbed. So digestion is not finished totally by pancreatic enzymes, but the bulk of it is done by pancreatic enzymes. The lining of the gut puts the final touches on digestion. But you, bring the, you break large molecules down into small by what the pancreas secretes. And it's a critical organ. You cannot live without it. It also is an endocrine gland. That is, it makes hormones like insulin and glucagon um, that are very important for metabolism, regulation of blood sugar. So the pancreas is a critical organ. It's a dangerous organ because if it puts digestive enzymes in the wrong place or if they escape the channels where you keep them thoroughly bottled up and going to the lumen of the gut to digest there, um, you can, you know, you're made of these same proteins that pancreatic enzymes digest. So if you let the pancreas loose on your body, it's what it secretes, it can do you in. So pancreatitis is a scary disease. And cancer of the pancreas is an extremely scary disease, in part because it's hard to operate on it, and in part because it doesn't give you symptoms and usually until it's too late. And so it's 98% fatal. So it, 
pancreas is one scary organ, but necessary.